All right, welcome back to Adobe Bridge. And we're gonna take a look at Adobe Bridge 2021. And this is gonna be my ultimate guide of how to use the whole program. Now this is gonna be one big giant long video. And the reason for that is I've broken videos up before and they don't seem to be as popular. So I'm just gonna have one big long video. However, I'm gonna timestamp it for people. So if you're looking for just a specific area, or you need to go back through it because you weren't sure how to do one aspect. I will timestamp it so you have quick access to get to that point. But I'm gonna start from the beginning and go over a whole bunch of stuff and go to the end. We're gonna add some new stuff that I've never had on the Adobe Bridge videos. However, it's going to be extremely long. I'm sorry for that if you don't like long videos, but the only way to do everything in Adobe Bridge is to make it really long. First thing we're gonna do is actually take a look at preferences. So we're gonna come up here and preferences are actually really important inside any program because this is gonna configure how your program works. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually go to Adobe Camera Raw preferences. And so if you don't know what Adobe Camera Raw is, a raw format is an unprocessed image and it's superior image quality to anything that we have in JPEG. This is for people who are shooting raw. And if you are shooting raw, most likely you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you can go ahead and skip over this part if you're just shooting JPEG images. In this preference menu, we're gonna configure how after you look at your images here and then you send your image to Photoshop, it's actually gonna open up in Adobe Camera Raw first because you have to open a raw image in a raw editor and Photoshop is actually not a raw editor. However, Lightroom, is exactly the same editing program as Adobe Camera Raw. Therefore, Lightroom can actually edit a raw photo because it's a raw photo editor, it's actually not a photo editing program. Yes, there is a difference. We've got general right here and we've got panels. And so this is gonna change how the panels work. I have mine just set up as default. If we wanna make it responsive, meaning that we wanna change how it works depending on different circumstances and different monitors, you can make it so it's responsive. You can do it in multiple windows or you can leave it back in single. For right now, we're gonna leave it as single, but we'll come back in here and I'll try to show you what that does. It also has a compact layout. I'm not gonna click that right now, but that's what that means. So film strip. So let me click off this real quick. So film strip is actually a menu up here and film strip is getting this. So when I click on an image, it shows up big here. That's the film strip mode. There's actually a couple different ways to view your data or information inside of Adobe Camera Bridge. There's no right, there's no wrong way. It's really personal preference. I actually like film strip. So we're gonna come up here and go back into Adobe Camera Raw and notice the orientation. Do we want them horizontally or vertically? And you can change that there. Right here, you see this, the name in the class. So this is where show file names and show ratings. I don't have any stars or anything added to these images yet, but we will be getting there. By default, these are not clicked a lot of times. So I'm gonna go ahead and click those. Look, you don't have to do the exact same thing as me, it's something you just need to try out and use it. Zoom and pan, so to use Lightroom style zoom and pan. So if you wanna use that, you click that button. Keyboard shortcuts. If you haven't been using Adobe products long, don't click this. But for those of you who were used to the old Command Z, right, it was undo. And if you kept hitting it, it kept undoing it. Well, it doesn't work that way anymore. So if you wanna go back to the legacy shortcut commands, you would click this. I've gotten used to them finally, so I don't need to use the legacy. We're just gonna go ahead and stay with the normal ones. File handling. All right, so this is gonna be actually one of the most important things that we cover here in Adobe Camera Raw. This is the number one question that I get in all my programs. People wanna know what in the daylights an XMP file is. They hate XMPs. They pop up under your normal file and they don't know what they are why they're there and they wanna get rid of them, but they're not sure if they should get rid of them. So I get tons of questions because they drive people nuts. The only way to get rid of an XMP file with a raw file is to convert it to DNG. So we can see right here, 
It says embed XMP in the DNG. So what the program would do would be convert all your raw files. So my raw files are down here. It says .cr2, that's Canon's raw file format. And your might be NEF or CR3, it doesn't matter. Whatever your raw file is, it's gonna convert it to Adobe's what's called digital negative. That's what DNG stands for. In that case, it can embed the XMP in there. You're still gonna have it, you just don't see it as an extra file. In just a second here, I'm gonna show you what that looks like and it will make more sense. Um, in my case, I actually like the .xmp files. So when you have a raw file, you can't resave it, you can't save over it, it's just always a raw file. So if you make any adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw, or you add any metadata to your image, it's going to store that information in the .xmp file. It's really just a text file, and we'll look at it here in just a second. So it saves that information. So if I'm in Adobe Camera Raw and I make an adjustment to this image, it stores that adjustment in the XMP file. If I ever come back and open that file up again, it will read the XMP and see that when I made the adjustment, I did plus 50 on exposure, so it'll automatically do that every time you reopen it. That's how it's saving it, and it does it automatically. You don't have to save in Adobe Camera Raw. When you make an adjustment, it just automatically applies that to the XMP file. The XMP is there either case. It's just one you can see it and one you can't see it. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at an XMP. So I've got these up. I've got two programs actually up, so this will make more sense here. Um, all right, so we've got this folder here and you can see right here I've got this, this is my raw file and I made a small adjustment and did some things to it. So when you do that, it creates this .xmp, which is a sidecar file. Now, this, I took this XMP and I dragged it over here into BB Edit, and this will allow us to see what's in it. So as you scroll through it, it's just got all the information. So any caption information or any adjustments that you make inside of the program are gonna be stored here on the computer. Anything that we see. So what we can do is see right here, I made an adjustment of 0.50 in my exposure. Instead of being zero, it's now 0.50. Every time that I open this photo, the computer is gonna to know to add that adjustment to the image. And that's all it's saving. Now, I do have some caption information. Notice how's my name and where I live and all that stuff. So all that information is in here and we'll just kind of scroll down through it. And that's where it's saving all that information in this .xmp. So we'll go ahead and turn it off and we're gonna go back to Bridge and we're gonna go back to Camera Raw Preferences. All right, you have your choice and you can make your decision on what you wanna do. Update embedded previews. So if you wanna update your embedded previews, meaning when you make raw adjustments, do you want the preview that the computer would show you on the raw file? Do you want it to account for the adjustments that you made? This is where you click that. I don't really care about that. So right here, so how do you wanna handle different files? So you can click on this. Mine's automatically open JPEG and Helix with the settings. So if you told your image to, in the camera, to be processed as an Adobe RGB, it would, it would apply that setting. You, same thing here with TIFF files, you're gonna have the option to set that stuff how you want. Performance. Photoshop doesn't really use the graphics processor. I don't know if Adobe Bridge does or not. I have mine just set on auto. Lightroom definitely does use a graphic processor, but if you want it to use this when it can, you can obviously set it to auto, custom, or off. I'm just leaving mine on auto. So your cache, and the cache is used really for like remembering these files. So when you open it up and you make adjustments to it, it saves it in the cache so it doesn't have to reread everything. And then usually after about 30 days, it will automatically delete old information, it won't save it. But you can purge the cache or you can increase it and you can also change the location. Raw defaults. In my case, I have mine set to the Adobe defaults and I'll show you that here in a second. What this is doing is when you open up an image in raw, you, you can control, and this is newer, which defaults it's using. I just use the Adobe ones, I like them better. But higher end cameras also have what's called camera profiles, like landscape, portrait, or custom ones. 
that you want to set. You can have Adobe Camera Raw use those instead of the Adobe ones, or you can upload some custom ones. I'll show you where those are in just a second. And then we've got workflow. So in my case, when you have a raw file and you adjust it in Adobe Camera Raw, before it sends it to Photoshop, it processes the image. And we are telling it how we want it to be processed. So in my case, I use the color space of Adobe RGB. I use 16 bits per channel. I'm not gonna resize the image, but I want the resolution to be 300 pixels per inch. You should absolutely never select sharpening because sharpening is the very last thing that you do because you need to size your image before you sharpen. The last thing that we have is, do you wanna open images in Photoshop as smart objects? If you're watching this and you're a graphic design editor and you know what smart objects are and you want them to op automatically open like that, click it, it's gonna be helpful. In my case, I don't use smart objects often, but occasionally I do, and it's just as easy to convert them in Photoshop. So I'm not going to check that. So what we're gonna do is I'll just take this image, I'm gonna double click it, and we're gonna send that, as you can see. We are now in Adobe Camera Raw. Remember those settings that we just looked at? They're right there. But right here is those color settings. And so when I change this, it's gonna configure how the image looks a little bit. And so this is where that color profile comes into effect. I actually like standard and portrait the best. If you wanted it to use something different and you can still get to them, you can hit browse and go in there and get the camera ones that are embedded on your camera. So this is what that's talking about in those raw camera preferences that we've seen before. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit done and come back out here to Adobe Bridge. So the next preferences that we need to look at are the preferences for actually Adobe Bridge. The first thing we have here is general. When camera is connected, it wants to launch Adobe Photo Downloader. And that is this little camera icon up here on the top left. Now the camera downloader is this. If you were to stick your, connect your camera to the computer or just slide your SD or memory card into the computer, that's what it's talking about. And this little thing would pop up and that is for downloading, taking your images off your camera or your card and moving them to a hard drive. So if you want that to pop up, you would click it. I don't use it, so I'm not gonna select it. The next thing we have is to double click your edits, camera raw settings in Bridge. If you want that, you go ahead and click there. So here it's command plus click opens the loop when previewing or reviewing number of recent items to display. Up here you can go recent items and you can control how many it remembers. Favorite items, you can select these and it's really easy, you can see right here, you can just go to your finder and drag a folder in there and add it. Next thing we have is advanced, so use software rendering. This disables hardware acceleration for the preview panel and slideshow settings will take effect next time the application is launched. So it's not something that I use, I'm not gonna set. Generate monitor size previews, meaning the largest preview that you can get. This would be full resolution. You can do this, it's gonna look better, but it's gonna take more time when you do something like that and it's gonna take up more room in your cache. Start bridge at login, meaning that as soon as you restart your computer, it's automatically gonna restart bridge. So cache, we talked about that just a little bit a few minutes ago. This is just for saving information that you use over and over again. These are the default settings. Um, purge cache, older than, this is probably a good one, 30 days. So it's most likely something you're not gonna use. So it just kind of cleans it out and keeps it more fresh when you do something like that. These are the, the settings that I'm gonna leave up here for now, but you can come in here and change those. Cache management. So we can change the way this works. So uh, purge, 100% previews. If you wanted to just come in here and manually purge them, you could do that. If you want to purge all the local, you could do that there. And if you want to change your location. So if you have a computer with an SSD and you don't have a lot of internal memory, you can move it to an external drive. I do actually use that sometimes on other programs. So to export, so this is just the, the dialogue. So the minimum number of exports to keep in the list, 100, maximum number in jobs in progress, 20. 
So if you'd like to change that, you can go there. File types. Bridge is made to work obviously with all the different Adobe applications. Therefore it handles a lot of different type of file types. If you find that it's not opening the file in the right program, this is where you would come set this. So if you wanted this to be a different file type, you'd come in here and pick a different file type. Now, obviously I don't have all the Adobe applications installed on my computer right now, so I'm limited as to what I'm getting right here, but it's giving me opportunities of what it thinks it should be. But if you do need to change something, this is where you're gonna do that in that preferences file. Interface, this is just how it looks. You click on it, it's gonna give you different looks. By default, I probably would use that one or this one. I'm just gonna leave it on this one. So the image backdrop, so we can control from black to white, the color. So these are kind of like presets, but you can go in here and refine it. So text size, you can make it bigger or smaller, depending on how you want it to look. So keywords, so automatically apply parent keywords. So if you want to do this to automatically apply um, parent keywords, you would check that box, write keywords. So there's little things in here that are going to help you write keywords and how they look. So if you need this delineator key, um, you'll see this in some programs. It's just kind of a quicker way to write something. And so to read those, you would do them here. But if you ha want more information on them, I can do a separate thing on what one of these delimiter keys are and how they work. Think of it as a quick key. Right here, we have all the different ways. So you can see right here, we can either buy stars or color, tag or call images. And this is something that we're gonna get into. So right here, it's showing you what the quick keys are. And what's weird about Bridge, it's just one of the only programs where it's different than other programs by default. It uses the command key to do it. I actually don't like the command key. I'd prefer to just hit one, so I would actually turn that off. So all I'd need to do to tag a photo now is just hit one, two, three, four, five. And these are the quick keys for all this, and these are the quick keys for the color. You can also change the name for these second to whatever you wanna do. Um, that's why it's editable there. I'm just gonna leave it by default media cache so do not delete cache files automatically automatically delete larger than 10 days so this is just more of that information and this is for video files basically what it's looking at instead of the other files so right down here metadata like what metadata properties that we want available i'd probably select everything but we can go through here and just select the ones that we want i actually use them all because they do a lot of editorial work. Output, view PDF after export, preserve embedded color profile. Preserving the color profile means that if you have a JPEG and you've embedded a color profile into that file, it's gonna keep that. Now in a raw file, you don't have embedded color profiles. You're not gonna apply that until you put it into the raw editor. When resizing margins, a lot of this is just how it's gonna look. You know, it's not anything fancy. Preserve transparency for images. You can click this stuff on and off to figure out what it does. So playback, uh, this must be for audio. Now, Adobe Bridge was, when it was invented, it was a horrible program because they made it work with every program they had. Now it's, it's a good program actually now and it's very quick, but it will open up our browse video files, uh, vector files, image files, anything that you want. So you're here, you're gonna be able to control how that works. So startup scripts, I'm not gonna be using any startup scripts in this one. And then thumbnails, how you want those to be seen. Do not process files larger than a thousand megabytes. You can change that. Um, prefer thumbnail generation over preview generation. Either way, this is gonna change your speed and how fast this works. Next we have is show transparency and show transparency grid. And that has to do with this the way it looks down here. So details, additional lines of thumbnail metadata. So if you want to add more or show metadata on hover, you can do that. So that metadata is that information that I showed you earlier. Um, for right now, I'm not gonna select any of that stuff. We're just gonna leave it as okay. And that is how you set up the preferences inside of Adobe Bridge 2021. 
All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch back to Essentials here real quick. Think of Essentials, Libraries, Film Strip, Output is just different looks. So each one of these little boxes here is important. So let's say metadata right here, we want to get rid of. Anything that you want to show or hide is really easy. You're going to go up to Window, and then you notice we have Metadata Panel, so we can just delete that, and now that's going to be gone. When you're looking at these, just because they are preset doesn't mean they're not configurable. We can change the size of them, but we can also either add or hide anything that we want. If I want metadata panel to come back, I can just click that. Bam, just like that, metadata panel is going to come back. It's got a predestined space that it's usually going to go into, but you can move it. So let's say I want to take this export and move it over here. Notice when that highlights blue, that's saying that it's moved. So I'm going from here, it highlights blue, I let go, bam, it's there. I wanna move it back. When it's highlighted blue, I let go, and it's back in its original spot. So you can move just about any one of these different windows anywhere you want. Another thing that you can do is you can configure the size of these areas, both vertically and horizontally. Now, they are limited as to how far you can go, but what I'll do is I'll show you. So if you look right now, I've just got this standard mouse cursor, which is an arrow, but I'm gonna hover over this little dark line right here. And when I do that, you should notice that it now changes to a vertical line with arrows on both sides. That means if I click and hold with my mouse, click and hold, and then I drag left or right, it will scale or reconfigure these windows to be any size that I want them to. Just like I did with the vertical line, I can come up here to a horizontal line and I can reconfigure this space. Like there's nothing here. So I could actually move this all the way up just like that because I'm not using that space. Now, if I open these, that's gonna cause an issue. Like if you go to folders, I've got a whole lot more stuff. Now we're getting that scroll bar, but you can configure any of these different areas by moving the bars. I'm going to actually go to film strip. We have these thumbnails down here and you can come down to this and actually slide these to make your thumbnails larger or smaller, but you could actually do the exact same thing by coming in between the two different rows and click hold and drag up and down. It's scaling. You'll notice when you do that, it is automatically moving that area right there. So you do have the ability to kind of change or hide or show things that are there. Just like before, we can go to film strip and if there's something I don't want my metadata template to be on right now, I can easily hide the metadata and then just remove it. Now I have so much more room. Or if it's something else that I wanted to add, like let's say the libraries panel, I can click on the libraries panel and bam, just like that, the libraries panel pops up. Or I can hide the libraries panel by coming back over here and clicking on it and getting rid of it. You do have the ability to control each one of these different screens, even though they are preset. So we're going to go back to essentials for right now. So the first thing that I think I'm going to show you how to do is how to actually open files. So obviously I have these open. Now I have an, a compact flash card, not an SD, a compact flash card in my computer. And that's that EOS digital right here. And basically there's a couple different ways to open files into bridge. My favorite thing about bridge is it doesn't catalog. So it doesn't cause issues because of that. So basically I can come over here and click on that and open it. And my files are actually in this EOS here. And all I had to do was click on it. And just like that, my files will appear. So you could drag or drop. So I could simply just drag a file onto the bridge icon in my dock here. So I could find the dock. I could drag it right here onto bridge and that would also open the files. So any way that you want to do it. So in this case, I just clicked on it. I have a folders. Um, I could do it from my favorites. So that's the first way. You're simply just opening the files into bridge and you can view and edit and do whatever you want directly from the program, just like that. Nothing fancy. All right, the next option is right up here, and that's called the camera downloader. Now, I'm a photographer. I think a photographer in general is going to use this option more often than either other people as far as a graphic designer or web designer 
page designer because we're drilling strictly with the image part of the application. So we're gonna come over here and we're just gonna click on that. I am not gonna make this my default. So what it's saying here is every time I insert a media card, like an SD card, do I want it to automatically launch the camera downloader program? I'm gonna hit no. Now by default, it comes up in kind of a simple form and you can use it straight like this. But what I'm gonna do is open up the advanced dialog box and I'm going to expand this so it's big so we can see what's going on here. Once again, you can see up here, this is the photo downloader and this is all the images that I have on the card, the same images that we just brought up a second ago. In this case, we're gonna be doing something different. This is something specific to a photographer, but we're gonna be taking our images from our memory card and moving them to a specific hard drive. Usually you don't wanna keep any images or work off a compact flash, an SD, a QXD, or any card like that. They tend to be slow and they're less stable. You wanna move your images to a hard drive, a safer place, and you should always back those up. So right here, you can see we're getting the images from the EOS, and if it doesn't show up, you could easily come in here and hopefully it should select it. If it doesn't, just pull your card out and put it back in and it should recognize the card. Next is where we want to move the images to and we, what we want it to do with those images. What we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a location. So in this case, I'm just gonna use my pictures folder because they don't usually do it. Normally I would do this on an external hard drive. I don't think it's really a great idea uh, today to save photos internally on a Mac because most SSDs aren't that big and you're gonna fill up your computer quickly and then your scratch disk is gonna be full and you're not gonna be able to work efficiently. But for right now, just cause this is a tutorial, we're gonna go ahead and do this. So I'm gonna hit open. So the path now is gonna be located on my pictures folder. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a subfolder, meaning a folder for these images to go in. Right now they would just all go not in a folder, but in that pictures folder, and I don't want that. So the way I work is I usually add a date, so I will just put 1-1-21, even though that's not the date, that will work. And then I'm gonna give it a name. So I'm gonna call this horses, because these are horses. And what this allows me to do is recognize just on the folder what the images are of and about when I took these images. Next thing I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna do the same thing. And obviously, if you have a different way, you can choose any one of these other options. I'm just gonna give these a custom name. So normally, I've already done this actually, you can see I've called these Acetig. I did this from Photo Mechanic. But normally, this would come up with some crazy weird DSC number that doesn't mean anything. And I want my images to actually mean something. So I'm gonna call these horses. And then I'm gonna start at the number one. And now you can see this is gonna be horse.0001.cr2. You can also preserve the current file name in the XMP file, which we talked a little bit about earlier. I want those images to open in Bridge. If you wanna to convert to DNG, this is where you would do it. And when you do that, you'll have obviously settings to do that. DNG is going to embed the XMP file in the DNG so it won't show up. So a lot of people like that. I actually like the XMP file. Delete original files. This is something that you should never select as far as I'm concerned. Basically what it's saying, as soon as it moves the files, it's gonna delete them off your card. This sounds like, oh, that would be a time saver. But if you have a problem or something goes wrong on the process of importing them, and your file gets corrupted on the move, you've, you've deleted your images off your card. Now, can you get some software and recover them? Yeah, most likely, but it's just safer. I do this after I've done this, so I'm gonna take my files and I'm gonna move them to a hard drive and then I'm gonna back them up to a completely different hard drive. Then I'll stick my card in my camera and I usually reformat from my camera, not from my computer. Right here, you can save the copies to a secondary location. So just like I was saying, back stuff up. So if you wanna save to here and then to save to your backup location at the same time, you can click this and then pick the location you want it to go to. Normally, you have the ability to add all the metadata that the metadata templates have right here, but it, this doesn't give you the option. You either get none 
or basic metadata, which is just your creator name and your copyright. Basically, I would be putting my name here and my name here. And then after I import it, you can go in and add all the other information in Adobe Bridge, but that's a pain in the ass. I don't know why they can't just add the full metadata template here. Because once you create it a lot of times, you don't have to like redo everything on it. You can just use that as a standard template. I mean, even Lightroom has this, but that might just be me. But for right now, this is all you can do. That's what you need to do. Any of these images that have check marks are going to be imported. Notice right here, we can uncheck all. So right now, nothing would be imported. Or I can come back here and hit check all. You could also manually select individual items if you wanted to do that. But in this case, we're just gonna go ahead and import everything. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and hit get media and you can see it's going through the process of moving those images. And then after it does that, it's going to render the previews for you to view the images inside of Bridge. It takes a little bit here for it to do its thing. Okay, and just like that, you can see now we are in the pictures folder. Here's that folder that I created, 1121 horses. And now the images have been imported and renamed. I'm happy with how that went. That is the photo downloader. It's actually really simple and easy to use. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at just the screen and everything that we see here. And we're gonna start here on Essentials. Now, a lot of the stuff is gonna be the same when we go to libraries and film strip and stuff, but it might be configured a little bit different. But this has a lot of stuff on it, so I think it's easy for me to show people what's going on. What we'll do is we'll start up here at the top on this little bar. So right here, we have a back and a forward button. Right now, we're not going forward because I haven't opened up other folders and then gone back. So if I went here, now I could go forward and then I will be back in the horses panel. Right here, this will reveal a recent file or folder that we might wanna to go to, so I can click on this, and it's gonna show some recent files or folders that I've used. The next we have is the boomerang, and this is gonna allow us to quickly and easily return to the application of Photoshop, so I can click that and I can go right back to Photoshop. This, obviously, as we talked before, is the photo downloader. Right here, we have what's called refine. And so I'm gonna click on this and I'm gonna to go to review mode. You can also do batch rename so that you're batch renaming the files or you can go to file info. But I'm just gonna do the review mode for right now. But if you do wanna batch rename, you can do that. You need to select the images and then you can batch rename. Under review mode and the quick key for that is command B for a Mac and most likely control B for a PC. But when you click on that, it's basically gonna bring up like a little preview window, kind of like CoverFlow, and then you can kind of toggle through the different images and look at them. Um, you can use a magnifying glass. You do have some options here to go through, and then to go out, you're just gonna click there. And that's just kind of an easy way to go through full screen and look at your images. We will deselect that, and we will come over here, and I'll select an image so you can see how this works. Um, so this will allow you to open an image directly or manually into Camera Raw. So even if I had a JPEG image that normally wouldn't go into Camera Raw, I could click that and it would send the JPEG into Camera Raw if for some reason I wanted to do that. But if I wanted to send this to Camera Raw, all I could do is click on that and it's gonna go straight to Camera Raw. The next is obvious, this is just rotating your images clockwise or counterclockwise. We'll skip these for now. And then way over here, you have a little search bar. So this will allow you to search and there's different ways in which you can search. Right here, this is showing you the path of where your files are located. So computer, Macintosh hard drive, users, me, pictures, horses. So that is just your path. Right here, we'll get into this, but it says browse quickly by preferring embedded images. Now, when you shoot raw files, it embeds a little JPEG preview and it doesn't render a preview. What it's saying is you can use that embedded preview, which will be quicker. Might not be as good a quality, but it might be quicker. Or you can come over here and these are options for quality. So if I click on this, you can see I can control the image quality. So I can use the embedded, I can do high quality, monitor size, meaning whatever your monitor is. 
If you have a 1920 by 1080 monitor, the largest size it's going to make it is 1920 because your monitor can't display anything longer. But if you have a monitor that displays something, let's say at 2600, it will make your preview 2600. If your monitor's 640, it will only make it 640. So that's what it's talking about. Always generate or just do it on demand, meaning you're telling it to do it. 100% previews, meaning it's going to be 100% of the image. If your image is 5,600 pixels, it's going to make your it's going to make your preview 5,600 pixels, which would be sort of ridiculous and take up a lot of time. If you want to learn more, you can do that there. So show transparency, show transparency grid, which is this stuff right here. You can turn that stuff on and off just to make it look different. So right here you have show transparency and show transparency grid, which I'll turn that back on. Right here we have the filter. It looks like a little martini glass with no bottom. So we're gonna go ahead and click on that arrow. And I'm gonna show you how this works right now. A lot of times as a photographer and in other professions, you might have more than 30 images to go through. What we're gonna do is obviously the previews here. I'm gonna do this in film strip just because I think it makes a little bit more sense um, to deal with photos like this. But basically, I'm using the keyboard, the right and left arrow keys, and you can see I'm toggling through the different images really quickly. And I'm gonna do a process called culling. Also, some people just call it tagging. Culling or tagging, it doesn't make a difference what you call it. It's just a process of selecting out the images that you like. Now, if you notice right here, we have a little thing with saying no stars, one star, two star, three stars, four stars, five stars, and we can also do colors. So if we come up here to label, it's gonna show us where what the quick keys are and what is available to us. Right here we have no rating is zero, reject is this quick key, one star is one, because I turned off the command key because I can't stand it. Two stars is two, three, four, five, um, to decrease the rating is command, to decrease the rating is command comma, and increase the rating is command period. If you don't like stars, you can do it by colors. So you'll get red, yellow, green, blue, and those are your colors. This one doesn't have a quick key. What I'm gonna do is just give things one star. I personally don't care if I have one star or five stars, it's not impressing me or making a difference. All I'm doing by saying, hitting the number one, so I'm gonna hit the number one, and when I say it, you're gonna see right here this star appear. So I'm gonna hit it, star appears. I'm gonna hit zero, star disappears. I'm gonna hit five, five stars. Three, three stars, all right? You can also just come in here and click on these if you prefer to do it that way. It doesn't make a difference. Remember, six is a color, so it's gonna tag it color red. So what I'm gonna do, and I'm just gonna use the number one because it lets me leave my left hand on the number one, I can just go through. So I'm gonna go through, in any image that I seem to like, I'm just gonna tag and give it a star. So let's say I like this one, and we'll go through, and maybe I like that one, and I don't like any of these, and we like that one. And those are the only photos that I like. Those are my favorites, so I've looked through all the images. Those are the ones I work with. Well, I don't necessarily need to see these images that I'm not gonna use anymore. So what I can do is filter them, and that's where this little martini glass comes up here. I'm gonna say, anything with one star or more, you can show me, everything else, delete. Now, notice this one has more than one star. These are all one. So let's say that this was my favorite. I could come up here and say anything with four or more stars, show me, and anything with less, don't show me. So now I'm only seeing that one. So I can come back up and just say one star or more, or I can click this and hit clear filter, and they're all back. That's a way to call or tag your images here inside of Adobe Bridge. And probably my favorite and most useful option. And what's cool is, remember, this is saving this process in that XMP file, whether it's embedded in the DNG, or it's a side card file on the side. This is what that XMP is saving. So if I come back a year later and drop these photos in, they're still gonna have these star tags and I can quickly just come here and do this 
and I'm going to see the images that I like. They don't have to bother with those. Even a year later, all this information is going to be saved for me. Unless I delete it, then it's not going to be there anymore. All right, so we'll just leave it like this for now, and we can go back to Essentials. Essentials shows the preview over here. Obviously, I could make this preview bigger if I wanted, so I can drop this down smaller, and we can move this side window over, and this is going to give me a bigger preview and less on the thumbnails. It's really up to personal preference. So right here, we can sort by file name. It's saying sort by file name, so this would obviously be number one. Or I could do date created. Um, these are all linear, so most likely it's all gonna be the same by size, dimension, resolution, color profile, any of these. You can sort these in order however you want. We can also change from ascending to descending by clicking this arrow. Now the last one is first and the first one is last, and I can click it and flip it back how it was before. So if we wanted to open a recent file, I could click here and open a recent file. If I want to create a new folder, and if I want to delete an image, obviously to delete an image, you have to select one or more images to delete it. So if you had just a blank file or an out of focus shot, and I didn't want this, I can come here and hit delete. Um, you can click this if you don't want it, but this is helpful for tutorials. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit okay and bam, just like that, that file is gone. Now that we've covered kind of the stuff up here on the top, let's scale down to the bottom. We're gonna skip some of this because this has to do with the export function. So right here, obviously I've showed you before, this controls the size of your thumbnails. You can also click the minus or the plus. Yes, there's three different ways to do the exact same thing. This is to unlock the thumbnail grid. So this is just configuring how this looks, right? So this is what we're at right now. So I can click on this one. I can click on this one. Notice that as I do this, it changes the way it looks. That's all you're doing, all right? This one has a different look, smaller thumbnails, but more metadata information, even smaller. And I'm just gonna go back to the first one that I had here. Here we have these little tiles, and this is this little darker gray area. So if you don't like that, you can unclick it and they're gone. If you only want the thumbnails only, you can just do that and it gets rid of the slug name and the label name. I actually prefer especially both of these, but especially the label name because it's something that I do use. And use the command key now on a PC, you guys probably will see the control key here instead of the command key for labels and ratings, meaning. So what this means is you're gonna need to hold the command or control key to do the labels and ratings, which is something that I definitely don't wanna do because I specifically turn that off. So we'll just go ahead and leave that like it is and move on to the next thing. Right here we have favorites. Now right now under favorites I have computer images, all these options. If I wanna to add to this, I can just go over here to my finder and let's go to documents. Let's say I wanna move this Adobe folder there. I can just drag this over. When I get that blue line, that means it's gonna go there and I can let go and I can put that folder there. Now this isn't something that I'm ever gonna use, but it's there. Folders aren't something you kinda of drop. This just scans your computer for any hard drive that you have and then you can navigate through it to find a folder just to open it up like I showed you in the beginning. So nothing fancy there. Filter, so this is just once again, different ways to rate. So I can rate my images directly from here. These are giving me the options when I rate. So if I want to add something to a filter option, I can do that. So I can say like, click on that. And now you'll notice, even though I had all this selected, the only one with a color, which was this, is gonna be the one that's rated. So instead of coming over here to do it, I can come over here to the rating. Now, what's cool about that that you don't really see is you can come over here and rate by keywords, any of these options. Look, I'm not gonna go through all these because it would take way too much time, but if you wanted to come over to color mode and, and rate just the images that have no color mode and there is one somewhere, and we'll click on that, I don't know what it is, it would show that, okay? You can rate or select or hide images by clicking on any of this stuff here. 
The next is collections. So if I click on this, notice Cooper is a dog and this picture of this dog comes up. If I click on Annabelle, it brings up another dog. Well, why? So this is my dog and this is my neighbor's dog. Let's say that I take pictures of those two dogs all the time. I can take a photo and drop it in a collection. So let's say at the end of the year, I'm gonna make a calendar of Annabelle from all the photos that I took from January through December. I wanna use one from every month. Well, obviously as I take those photos, that's gonna be a whole lot of different locations because I'm gonna have different folder for every time that I took those photos. And in those folders are gonna be thousands of photos. I just wanna pick the good ones. In this case, what I can do is when I am looking through my images, and I think I might have those dogs up there. All right, so here's those dogs. Let's say that I have another picture of Annabelle that I like a lot. Let's say it's this one right here with their tongue out. All I need to do is drag this over and let go. And now that picture is in this file as one of the ones that I like. Now this does not move the image to a new location. It just remembers the path of where it's located at and allows you quick access to it. So even though we might have images from shot at different times and put in different folders, they can all be located in one location. And I can do that with Cooper or my child or whatever else that I want. Maybe just my favorite images of the year. I can also sort by something that's called a smart collection. And it's a series of variables that isolates images. So if you notice this one says one star or greater. So what that's gonna do is any image that I have given one star or more, it's going to display it. Now, it's showing a whole bunch of different genre, but it's anything with a one star or more, it's gonna show. Down here, we have these little boxes. To create a new collection, you would just click this and it would give you a new collection and I'll just call this trees, even though I'm not gonna do anything. And then right here, we have the smart collection. So when you do this smart collection, look in, and so it's saying this is my computer or I could change this to a different hard drive. And then I can change any of this information so it searches for something. Um, if I wanted it to be copyright notice, I could literally say copyright notice that contains, and then I could put the text here of what I wanted to search for. So you can make the variables anything that you want. You can have it look inside of subfolders, include non-index files, this might take a long time, and then you hit save. So that would create, I'm gonna hit cancel here, a new smart collection. So you can make it look for photos that are labeled with the red color, or just three stars, or just five stars, or images that are shot vertically, anything that you want. So that's what collections do. Right here, we have some export functions. Look, I'm not gonna be going through the export functions. I'm just gonna show you that they are. The next thing that we have here is for a custom export. Now, right now, they only have one export created, which is export to DNG. But if you wanted to create a new one, you would just come down here, hit plus, and then you get the options to tell it what you want it to do. So saving options, where do you wanna export it to? So you can decide a specific folder. You can browse to it, you can save it in a subfolder, manage conflicts. So if there was two files named pig, you can have it create a unique file name. You can do different file formats as image size. You can scale the image. And if you wanna scale it, you can use that. If you wanna resize the image, you can resize the image here. Anything that you wanna do. Right now, it's just gonna keep it the size that it is. If you want it to include metadata, or if you wanna apply a metadata template to it, you can also do that there. I'm gonna hit cancel because I'm not gonna do that. And then you can export right here from Adobe Bridge. I don't really normally export photos from a browser because they haven't been edited yet. Occasionally I do. Actually, this is something that Lightroom does really, really well. So when I'm doing some bulk exporting for galleries online, I tend to use Lightroom, but but I could definitely use Adobe Bridge to do the same process if I wanted. So that is export. Preview, obviously, let's go back so we can get an image here. We'll click on this. So preview is just obviously showing us our preview. Nothing fancy there.
if you want to publish this to Adobe Stock, because we work with Adobe Stock or Adobe Portfolio, we can use the publish function right here to publish that. Next thing we have is keywords. And so this will allow you to add keywords to your images. Now, what I hate about the metadata, and you can see there's tons of metadata. Let's make this bigger so we can see it. This is what I wanted to add in that camera downloader. Remember where I could only do my name and it drove me nuts. I actually add a lot of information to my files. Now I don't want you guys to see some of this. So obviously I'm blurring it out when I open it up. But you can see I've got all this information right here that I've added. Well, this is what I wanted to add in the camera downloader. The way it works is I could now add keywords or metadata after the fact. So if I wanted to quickly just say that these were sought in San Jose, which they weren't, I can click that. And that's gonna give them the keyword of San Jose tag to the image. If these were graduation or any of these other keywords that I've created, I have given it uh, 2015 horses, Assateague Island and Katie our keywords already embedded in the previews and any of the metadata here that I would want to add or change, I could do that. Basically, there is a way to add the metadata to multiple images. Um, I'll show you this later, but basically you would select the images and then go up here to tools and you can either do batch rename, you can create a metadata template or in this place, append metadata and, and that would replace it all. But we're, we're not going to do that right here at this point. So I have uploaded some different images here and you'll notice I've got a whole bunch of different types of image. And I think one of the things that's important for people, it's just not a photo browser. We can watch movies and you can see over here, I've got the preview very small, but we can preview the movie if you want to preview a movie and we can also look at vectors. So any file type, you're going to basically be able to view and open into different programs here in Adobe Bridge. What we're going to do is the first thing that we have up here is essentials and essentials is really what you think. It's just everything that you might need. Um, it's got a lot of stuff. It's not organized well, because if you look at this, the thumbnails are about as big as the preview is. And that doesn't make sense. This doesn't mean that I couldn't move stuff so I could take the preview and move it over here. And then I could take the content and I can move the content over here. And now I've got these little previews over here and I could say, oh, that's too, too, too small. So what I can do is remember you can resize most of these windows so I can make these windows a little bit bigger or smaller so I can easily resize and make anything larger or smaller depending on what I want. I'm just going to go ahead and move this back to the default so it's not confusing for people because when they open it up, if I have mine different, a lot of times people um, are not quite sure what they're doing. So let's go ahead and open this stuff up and we will make those a little bit bigger and that looks pretty good. So essentials is easy. What we looked at before is basically the essentials. So let's go ahead and take a look at libraries. So libraries is optimized over here to use the library. Now the library is online. You see down here, we've got a little cloud. So this is a cloud option. Usually when you subscribe to the cloud, you're getting so much cloud space that you can use with your purchase. Maybe your photo, you get two gigabytes, maybe you get 10 gigabytes, maybe you get 20 gigabytes. You get a certain amount, plus you can also buy more space. You also have the ability to share libraries, so to work in collaboration. So let's say I'm doing the photos with someone in California on the other side of the continent, I'm in Pennsylvania, is doing the layout. We can work off a shared library, so as I'm updating the images, they can update the images in the layout. That's one option. You can also view other people's libraries or you can create your own online library. Now, everything that I do is locally. I work off local hard drives. I don't usually need to put something up on a cloud. And if I'm sharing stuff, a lot of times I'm just using Google Drive instead of my Adobe Cloud. Now I could easily do that if I wanted. But what I'm going to do is we'll take a look here. So if you notice, it says find a public libraries right here, meaning that you can view or browse public libraries as well as your own library. So if I was to click on this, it's going to go ahead and launch the browser and it's going to go into 
my creative cloud account and now you can see there's all these public libraries that we can take a look at and since this one um right here says tacos and pizza we'll just go ahead and hit view more or i could hit follow but we'll hit view more and this is going to give us access to their public library so you can see in this we have some different colors and some graphics and if you want to look at a specific graphic or color all you need to do is come down here and click on it and so this is one way that you can view some public galleries online well we come back here and notice it says all libraries and then we can manage your libraries i can set up my own custom libraries and so when you first open it you're going to get this little tour and what it's going to do is explain to you how the creative cloud works and how the cloud libraries work so it's use use cloud documents to access and easily work on all of your devices meaning if you had a tablet or phone or different computers or you work at work and you work at home you can put stuff on your cloud library and it's going to allow you to not have to bring a hard drive or shift images from one spot to another it's a central location that's going to allow you to work from different locations now during covid this is a great time to use something like a cloud library where somebody that normally would work in an office is going to be working at home so everybody in that department can use a cloud library and work together so we'll go ahead and hit take tour just so we can see what we have here so right there if you want to find or add public libraries we can do that up here on the public libraries so we'll just hit done so we can collect and manage shared libraries we can browse your computer to add elements, meaning that we can add creative elements from our own computers. And we can use libraries in all of the Adobe apps, meaning that these libraries are gonna be accessible from Photoshop, Illustrator, any of the programs that Adobe has. Now, if I wanted to create my own custom library, I can come over here to my library and create a new library. Let's say I wanted to make one for my dogs i could click make a library upload some images for my dogs i could share them with somebody if somebody was doing a design or maybe an illustration using one of those pictures All right so those are your libraries so we're going to switch back over here to bridge right here we have create new library and we have my library and then find public libraries so those are the different types of things that you can do you can also search the libraries as well Notice over here, whenever you have a little menu, it's just gonna allow you to get more information. But once again, just a different way to create, import, learn more what's new, or provide feedback inside of your libraries. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is something that we've been looking at, which is Filmstrip. Filmstrip optimized more for a photographer's point of view as far as doing this. Now, by default, usually you're gonna have another panel here, I think, I've gotten rid of that, but it doesn't really matter what you do, you can easily come over here and you can add different things to different places. So if you do need to move stuff around, feel free to move stuff around. We're just gonna quick and skip over to output since we basically already covered essentials in film strip. So right here, output is exactly what it says. This is a way to export or save out images from Bridge. Now, normally I would be doing this from Illustrator or from Photoshop or Lightroom or any program that I'm using. It's kind of odd. I don't think it's a typical thing that you would do that you would export from Bridge, but maybe I had a gallery with 100 images and it's just easier at this point. Or in this case, it looks like they're trying to create a contact sheet or something like that but this is going to allow you to export images. So over here we have export and we can create custom little export buttons over here, but we also have some output settings that we can do here. First, we can pick the type of thing that we wanna do. So it looks like fine art mat or maximum size. So let's say maximum size, or we can create something custom. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up document. So right now it's on the page size of A4, Let's just go to letter because I think it's easier for people to understand. And if you want to take an image, it's really easy. We can just drag an image up here and then bam, just like that, we have laid it out in this template and we can output it. Now I'm going to go ahead and switch that because this is the wrong way. We want to make this landscape and now it kind of fills that frame. Now it's not filling 
totally because this ratio is different than this ratio. So we could either crop it or we can scale the image if that is something that we'd wanna do. So you'll notice right here, page width and size, you have the availability to custom do that. We can change the background color. We can change the image quality. Right now it's at image quality of eight. I can raise that and make it so it's a better image quality. We can rotate our thumbnails or anything that we wanna do. We can include the file name. So it includes the file name for some reason. If you wanted to include your file name right there, any of that stuff that you could do. We can control the layout. So right now it is one column, one row. If we wanted to increase that, we could change that to increase how that works. Not something that I use a lot, but some people might. So cell spacing, cell size. So right now, notice the cell size is bigger than the image size. So I could actually change this if I wanted. So I could change the height to make the height of the cell size and the image size be exactly the same. I can control my margins. We'll go ahead and close that. So we've got a header and footer. So if we wanted to add some text or include something in a header or footer, we could definitely do that there. We can add a watermark here. With a watermark, you can either do a text watermark or an image watermark, and it's gonna allow you to control opacities and placement. And if we're going to be exporting as a PDF, we can add the PDF properties there as once. Once you do whatever you wanna do here, you have the little button down here to export it and whatever file type you've set up here in your document. That is different ways to output. The next thing we have here is optimize for metadata. If you are interested in adding metadata, going to the metadata thing is gonna make more sense than some of the others. So we don't really need to have a big image, we need to have a big area for metadata. And so this is just going to allow you to work on your metadata. Metadata, you can come over here and add manually, or in just a few minutes, I'm gonna come up here to show you how to use tools and append and replace metadata, that method. Keywords is just like it says, just like metadata, we can set up keywords and easily add keywords to different images so that they are searchable within Adobe Bridge. We can either create keywords or simply just click on a keyword to add a keyword to any selected images. Now you could shift click and select multiple images and then add a keyword to that specific group of images because all of them are selected or we can unselect that to remove that there. Right here's a quick way to look at this. So notice we have essentials, libraries, film strip, output, metadata, preview. So we have a couple options that aren't available up here. So we've got preview and that's basically gonna be optimized. So we have this giant preview window in the thumbnails over here, which I actually do kind of like. We have light table, which is another version where you just have basically your thumbnails and we've removed all the other information. And then we have folders and that's going to display or be optimized to be using folders. And with any of these, you can still configure them. Don't feel, remember, you can come up here and you can add a preview panel just like that to anything. Even though we were in a custom panel for what was that thing called folders, I can easily add preview back to it so I can kind of customize the look and get it exactly how I want. All right, so let's start taking a look at the menu options up here. So we're gonna start with file. This is pretty simple. Some of these are just what they say. We don't need to go into them. Don't forget the command keys are always over here. I'm on a Mac, so we're gonna have command and on a PC, you're gonna end up seeing this as control but we have the option to do a new window, a new folder, to open a document, to open with. Now, it has specific programs on here because these are what's installed on my computer. Someone else that has different programs is gonna have some different options. Open recent, meaning recent files, open directly into camera raw, to close a window, to move to trash, to return to Photoshop. 
Now, remember, a lot of these are kind of the slow way. We have icons already up here that are doing this exact same thing. Bridge, Adobe products have multiple ways usually to do the exact same thing. Reveal and Finder, search Adobe Stock. So if you wanted to search for, let's say, a picture of a horse or a cat in Adobe Stock, you could click on this and it would take you directly to Adobe Stock and you could look for that image. And what's cool about that is you don't actually have to purchase Adobe Stock to use them in a document. You can actually download that and just use a small thumbnail as like a placeholder to see if your client or you like it. And then if you do like it, then you can purchase the image, which is a wonderful option. Export too. So here's just a quick export. Remember, we can create new exports. I don't have any created. I just have these two right now, but I could create as many as I wanted. Export progress, get photos from the camera, import from device. Move to, so we can move an image or a folder to a different location. We've got copy to, place, add to favorites, and file info. So file info would be showing you metadata. Next thing up here, we have edit. So we have the ability to cut, copy, paste, and duplicate, to select all, to deselect all, to invert a selection, to find something, develop settings. So these are saved develop settings. So camera roll defaults, that's what it's talking about. Copy camera settings, previous conversion, or clear settings to edit capture time, meaning the time that the image was taken. So if you wanted to change when this was taken, it says, let's say 2020, and it should be 2021, you could do that. Revert to capture time original, rotate, color settings, now the color settings are weird on here. They're good. These are seem like they're more set up for kind of CMYK and offset press capabilities. I'll go ahead and click on them. So they only have one and it's called monitor color. That's really the only normal RGB color. Everything else is sort of a pre press setting. Um, looks like we have a web internet. So these are just basic settings that you have here. If you want to see or show the expanded list, you can come up here and this is gonna give you some more options. But in this case, it does have some color settings. They're not the most advanced settings on this browser that you do get in some other applications. As a photographer, these aren't really helpful for me, but if I was a designer and this was gonna to go to a press, then these settings are gonna be perfectly fine. And the last thing is to start dictation, so you could start and talk and it can dictate. All right, our next thing is going to be view. So we can do a full screen view, which is also the space bar. We can create a slideshow. Here are our slideshow options. We can do review mode. So what I'm gonna do is I'll just go ahead and click on slideshow. I don't think creating slideshows in these applications are great. This is just uh, okay if you're doing like a presentation and you wanted to show people what you're doing, but you could click on this and it's gonna give you how this kind of simple slideshow would work and you can set this up exactly how you want it i'm just going to hit done because i'm not going to use it review mode as thumbnails as details as a list so i can change this to list and that's just controlling the content and how you view it we're going to take this back to thumbnail that's going to make more sense so we can sort and we can refresh this if i added an image to this folder and i wanted to refresh so it would pick it up i could easily do that The next thing we have is stacks. And so what stacks mean are, let's say I had this image and I had like four versions of it and I selected all four versions of it right here. I can click those and then put group as a stack. So instead of having this picture in black and white and maybe a color graded image, I can stack them all together. So it only takes up one spot and it will show it as a stack. I'll just do these since it doesn't really matter. I'll just put group as a stack and now you can see it gives you that option as a stack and so we can go through the different stack images right there. So that's what that means and that's how it works. You have stacks in Lightroom as well. So we can expand all stacks if we don't want that to be a stack anymore. We can change the frame rate of the stack and you can auto stack doing panoramics or HDR but we don't have either one of those right now so we're not going to go ahead and do that. 
So right here is label and label is what we were talking about earlier. This is just simply the tagging or color process, but just kind of a slower way and it gives you the quick keys of what's available. In this case, uh, we, we want to go to an image and now this should show up. And so we have no rating, reject, stars, decreased rating, no label, meaning it goes back to default. So these are your different options. Remember, you can control what these say if you want, but I've really found no reason to change that information. It doesn't make a difference to me. So I have these images and right now these images don't have any metadata in them at all. If I was to come in here and go to essentials and we look down here in the metadata, you can see there's, there's nothing available here. We're going to start off first doing batch rename and this isn't going to be really effective for this because it's just a variety of images, but we'll, I'll show you how it works. A lot of people get into the process and I get calls with this all the time that they have millions of images and they need to organize them. So we're going to assume that these all images are of the same genre or same kind of idea, even though they're not. I'm going to select them all and I'm going to rename them. So right now they all have different names. We'll just assume that they're all pictures of animals, let's say. So we're going to go up here to tools and go down to batch rename. So the first thing I'm going to do is notice we have some presets, but I'm just going to leave default right here. Rename in same folder, or we could move it to a new folder or copy to a new folder. I'm just going to put rename in same folder. The text, so we're going to change the text, but we could change anything that we wanted here, any option to animals. Receive the current file name in XMP, so whatever that original file name is, which is this, 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 or this, do we want to keep that? In this case, I don't really care. Compatibility, so do we want to do it with Windows, Mac OS, which select here, because I'm in a Mac, but if I want it to make it compatible with Windows or Unix, I could select those. And basically that's it. And so now I can just hit re rename and you can say, bam, just like that. Now we have animals one, ba 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 just like that. It's renamed everything to animals. So we've batch renamed everything here in this file setting. Now, when I go search for the word animal and I'm looking for images with the slug name animal, all these are going to show up. The next option that we have here is what I really wish was in the Camlet downloader, which is to either append metadata or replace. Append means add to, replace means you delete everything that's already there and you replace it with this. So the first thing that you're going to want to do is create your own metadata template. So we're going to create one and we're going to call this test meta. And I'm going to select this and all I'm going to do is put JW cause it's easy. And I'm going to go through all these different options. So JW, that could be a headline, my description JW. So I can come in here and put city and we could call this W here. I love Pennsylvania. So we'll put PA. So you can go through all this information and you should anything that you want selected, you need to click this box and it can be added. I actually do have a lot of this stuff filled out. I'm not going to go through and explain what this stuff means. If you don't know what it means, it's easy to find out or just kind of read and look what it says. And basically you're going to want to fill that out. Once you've got all this filled out, you're going to have a basic metadata and this basic metadata template can be specific for the project that you're working on or something universal for, in my case, I have my address, my phone number, my contact information, my websites, my email, all that type of stuff. I have image rights, copyright, all that stuff, intellectual property. So any of that information is what I'm adding to my metadata. Then I can hit save. And now remember, none of these had any metadata added to them. Doesn't even have the camera metadata. So then I can come up here since I've got every one of these images still selected and I can go to either append, which in this case, it won't make a difference because there's nothing there or, or I can do replace. So I have one with my name. We're going to do the test metadata. 
and I'll click on that. And just like that, now all these images are going to have that metadata added to them. So animals, there's that JW that I added. I could also come in here and click this little edit button and manually add it. So city, I live in Camp Hill. So I can add Camp Hill manually to that location. All right, hit apply and good to go. That is how you add metadata. So under tools, if we want to edit our metadata templates, we can go there and then we can edit any template that we have. Remember, append is add to, replace means that you're totally replacing everything. Here we can manage our cache. And if you don't understand what manage cache is, basically when I loaded this in, it rendered previews according to how I had this set. And the way I had that set was over here. I wanted a high quality preview. The cache is where it's storing that preview. When I import it again, it just renders and comes up really quickly. Well, after a while, you don't want to save every rendered preview that you've ever had because you're not using them anymore. So you can come in here and you can control or manage your cache or purge your cache for anything. So if I wanted to purge the cache, for bridge tutorial, which is the folder that houses these images. So right here, I have media encoder, so I could add an encoder to the queue. I'm not sure if people actually use a media encoder in bridge. I would never use it. I use Final Cut Pro, so I would just use Final Cut Pro. Adobe Premiere, you could use Adobe Premiere. Maybe some people do use a media encoder, so you would add this here and you could use that there. So Premiere Pro, do we want to edit or create a sequence in Premiere Pro? We have Photoshop. So these are like Photoshop has, these are kind of like little programs within the program that you might use. If you wanted to do a batch process, this would send you to the batch process area of Photoshop, the contact sheet, the image processor into lens correction, which is kind of weird. Um, to load files into layers, to merge the HDR Pro, which makes sense, to photo merge, which is like doing a panoramic. So any of this stuff, and then they have the options here for Illustrator. This is actually one that I use. I love Image Trace. So going to Illustrator and going straight into Image Trace, it's just kind of a quick way to get to that area. Those are kind of like quick little options or ways to send it to specific programs. And then window down here, we have workspace. So we can pick the workspace manually from here, or we could have done the workspace from here. We can also add any extensions here. So if I had extensions added and I wanted to add an extension, I could do that. So here's your different panels, and these are the panels. We can minimize this, we can bring all to the front, or if you wanted to watch a tutorial other than this tutorial, from Adobe on how to do something. They now have added tutorials to most of their programs. So if you wanted to find out how to do something, they do have tutorials. I've never looked at them. Don't sure if they're any good, but they have tutorials inside of Adobe products now. And the last thing that we have is just a basic help panel inside of the program. Well, that's basically it. That's everything that I know of inside of Adobe Bridge 2021. Hopefully you found this video helpful. And if you have, feel free to give this image a thumbs up. It really helps me when it comes to placing higher on searches for Adobe tutorials. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave those below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.